Thank you, Anthony. Now, we've all heard uh, that deniers like Anthony and others are well-funded by the oil companies. <laughs> but in fact, just the opposite is true. Uh, Anthony has done his work as a volunteer. And history will record that uh, work by Anthony Watts and Steve McIntyre and other volunteers have brought down climatism. And one of my favorite quotes is something that Anthony has said, uh, the theory is wrong, the evidence has changed, and thousands of volunteers have exposed it. Our next speech, speaker is uh, Richard Keene. Dr. Keene became a meteorologist at the age of seven, the morning of Hurricane Hazel, uh, when it tore through his neighborhood in Pennsylvania. He has kept a log of the daily weather every day for over 50 years and for the past 20 years as a National Weather Service Co-op Observer in Coal Creek Canyon, Colorado. Along the way, he studied phenomena such as El Nino, Arctic climate change, severe storms, and volcanoes, and has published numerous papers in major journals. He is now retired from the University of Colorado, has written or co-authored more than a dozen books, and continues to study climate change. Please welcome Dr. Richard Keene. Okay, thank you. Thank you, great to be here, glad you're here. Um, okay, I'm going to sort of follow up on what Anthony said and do an application of this data that he discussed the qualities of. Uh, some of it's good, some of it isn't. But it is data, and in the theme of what the NASA folks were talking about this morning, data is important, data is reality. You do just have to keep in mind the quality of it, but you don't want to mess with it too much. So I'm going to be talking about a century of climate change in Alaska, data versus, i.e. reality versus the models. Okay, so why Alaska? Um, most models, IPCC models, they have composites of models. I think they published 24 models. All of those predict that Alaska, and curiously along with Colorado, will have the fastest global warming or at least regional warming over the next century of roughly four degrees Celsius or seven degrees Fahrenheit over 100 years. Also, Alaska is a poster child of climate change. Polar bears are up there drowning polar bears, swimming polar bears, pair polar bears roasting penguins that they import. Okay, so anyway, and of course Ben and Jerry's has gotten in on this and they named one of their ice creams Baked Alaska. The theme Baked Alaska has gotten quite popular. I even use it in titles sometimes when I talk about Alaskan climate. Okay, so part one of this will be the reality of it, the data. Uh, kudos to the National Park Service. They funded the compilation of data that I did. What they wanted was a data background, a compilation of all the data that existed for the parks in the, in the central Alaska region. And so my job was to dig up that data, collate it, do the appropriate means and summaries and tabulations and a little bit of analysis. I will emphasize though that any opinions I may give are those of me and not of the National Park Service. You know, they wanted a, a tech report with the data summarized in it and that's what they got. And now I'm analyzing and interpreting the data. So the region there in central Alaska, you can see it circled in red, are the three parks, Denali, Wrangell, St. Elias, and Yukon Charlie. Numbers, 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 data, data, data. 95 stations over the period of record. The period of record begins in 1899 when some sourdough start taking maximum temperatures in Fort Yukon, Alaska. And the record continues to this very day. Um, and there's 38, okay, anyway, there's the summary of the stations. 50 of these are actually surprisingly long-term stations and enough of them either individual stations or stations that moved slightly or had a, a, a modest change such that the station records could be merged, provided nine records uh, covering anywhere from about 80 to 100 years of total data. The climatic oath at the bottom, first do no harm <laughs> to the data. In other words, unless you not only a probable cause but absolute cause, 
don't mess with it. Don't add it up, don't add it down, don't do any funky adjustments to it. You know, it's data, it's what was observed. And that is my guiding rule, so I do not mess with the data, and I do not homogenize it. I'm not paid like Jim Hansen to do that, so I leave the data alone. So one station's record, here is, what is it, Fort U no, Eagle, Alaska. It's up in the interior. And Alaska, I guess you can say it has a very robust climate. It goes up and down. There's a 12 degree range of climate there from year to year. That's enormous. You know, that's probably twice or three times what you'll see in Chicago. Enormous swings of temperature, which makes the place a delight to study climate changes. So what I've done is I combined the stations, the nine long-term stations into one grand mean and Admittedly, this is some tweaking of the data, but I normalized it by the standard deviation of the individual stations, and the reason is that the interior stations of Alaska, like Fort Yukon and Eagle, have enormous swings, whereas the coastal stations are much more moderate. Well, if you do a straight average, you emphasize the interior, so a little bit of adjustment there. But what you have here is a combination index of these nine stations for Alaska. And you can see the climate is varies quite a bit. Now, I did a five-year running mean. Why not 10? Well, 10 works well. But five years, you can see these changes that go on from decade to decade. But still, you have enough samples. You retain enough samples that you can do some statistics on it. If you do a 50-year mean, well, you end up with two samples. You can't do any statistics. So what do you see? This goes from 1900 to 2010, warming through the first part of the century to about 1940 or so. Then suddenly, in the mid-1940s, the bottom drops out of the Alaskan average temperature. It stays cold for about 30 years. All of a sudden, 1976, Jimmy Carter's elected. Disco. <laughs> Disco rules the earth. Okay, so it was great time. Uh, temperature jumps up again and stays warm. There's some hint there at the very end that there may be a bit of cooling again. You know, we'll see. Again, that's only the past few years. If you're doing five and ten year means, obviously you need a dozen or more years to really be sure. So, attribution. I believe that's what they're talking about upstairs right now, or causes of these changes. Well, the quick and dirty way to try and find some cause, or at least a correlation, is get these indices. And there's dozens of indices. I call it alphabet soup here. You can get these from NOAA and NCAR, and tabulations, seasonal, monthly, annual, et cetera, et cetera. And each one of these combinations of letters has a meaning. Uh, some of the ones on the bottom I made up myself, but most of them are actually real. And the ones in red are the ones that end up being important. The NP and the PDO, and then down there at the bottom there's CO2. So what is the NP? The NP is the North Pacific Index. It is a measure of the pressure inside this big low. So what you see here is a map of the North Pacific, Alaska on the right, Siberia on the left, this low pressure system, and normally it's there sending nice warm maritime air into Alaska. Well, if the low gets stronger, which means the pressure decreases, those southerly winds get stronger, Alaska gets warmer. Conversely, if the low is weaker and the pressure is higher, Alaska gets colder. So there should be a correlation between the strength of that low and the temperatures in Alaska. And it also turns out that that low varies in strength over decades. It's not like it just changes from day to day. It changes slowly on average over decades. And here is a correlation between the five-year means of Alaskan temperature and the five-year pressure of this Aleutian low. And the low pressure scale is inverted. So up is means a stronger low but higher pressure, I mean lower pressure. So the pressure is at the bottom, temperature is at the top, and I don't think you have to be a statistician to see a wonderful correlation here. Something that's almost suspici suspiciously good for 
climate. You generally don't see correlations better than 0.2 in this field. In this one, the correlation is almost 0.8 on this time scale. Okay, the North Pacific Oscillation is the atmospheric component of the PDO, which is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So essentially you have an ocean-atmosphere interaction when the low spins up and gets stronger, it redistributes the temperature pattern of the ocean, which then maintains the low in that intensity, and then after some decades, the thing reverses, the Pacific pattern shifts, and the low weakens for decades. And it goes on and on for a, a few decades at a time. So the last switch to warm Alaska was 1977. It may have switched again in 2006. It has been going on forever. We didn't cause this. Here's some tree ring records indicating the PDO going back to 18, or no, 16, 1600. Okay, so statistically, then if you subtract out the effect of this North Pacific oscillation from the actual temperature record and look at the residual, this is what you get. Basically, noise, correlate it with carbon dioxide, you get a meager correlation of 0 0.04, meaningless, and at most the CO2 contribution is 0.2 degrees Celsius to the climate change in Alaska over the past century. So, summary so far, variability is due almost entirely to these oceanic oscillations. There's an Atlantic or an Arctic oscillation that adds a little bit of signal in there. So internal and natural variability rules the climate of Alaska. CO2 is minimal, and also I did it for snowfall. Snowfall, same story, natural variations. So the models, Alaska's predicted to warm four degrees. And here's another version of it. And on the left there in the pink bar is the model reconstruction of the past century with the black line being the supposed observations. And the extrapolation to the future is that sort of orange band extending upwards. Okay, so first of all, I'll pick a bone with the IPCC climate history. This is what I draw from that graph. You may notice it looks a little different than the numbers I got. How different? Here we go. Well, the IPCC gets their data from the Hadley Group, the CRU in, in England, and they use mysterious processes that they don't want to release under Freedom of Information Act, so nobody really knows what they do to the data. However, I can see that they're adding a degree to it systematically over the course of the century. They are introducing Adjustments like Anthony talked about of one degree of artificial warming into their data set. Meanwhile, the models also show one degree warming, and this is their model, the centroid of the model reconstruction of the past hundred years, and it shows a steady warming. What does the models not show? And I'll give you a hint, it begins with a P. PDO, it's not, I, I see no PDO in there. And meanwhile, the PDO dominates the Alaskan climate. So, what did they say about their model's failure to even show anything that looks like the PDO? Well, they admit the models underestimate it, but then paraphrasing, and I'm extracting this from the report because this concept appears in several places, changes over the last 50 years exceed model estimates of this model, of this natural variability. Therefore, the difference is due to, of course, global warming or CO2 or AGW. You know, or rephrasing again, even though the models underestimate it, the changes are not due to the failure of the models, the changes are due to anthropogenic causes. And they use the failure of the models as proof or evidence of the anthropogenic effects. So this is a great quote from a, one of the fellows on the IPCC. People underestimate the power of models. Observational evidence are not, is not very useful. <laughs> that's, that's a mindset, you know? And it's not a mindset I subscribe to. So power of models indeed, this is my model. 
which actually works much better at modeling and mimicking the PDO. I rolled dice 100 times and came up with a fairly nice cycle. So, yeah. in other words, the IPCC models are not even as good as rolling dice. So the easy out, how do they get out of this? Well, you truncate the data, you say such and such start at 1950 or 19, it's, it's warm such and such or hurricanes have increased or whatever has happened, well, while ignoring the full record and here's a set of three arrows showing three trends with different starting periods and you can see which ones the IPCC picks and which ones I would pick. And I would call this the big lie, and the big lie is selecting your data point to begin in 1950, 1960, 1970, when most meteorological parameters do show evidence of some sort of warming trend. But then you're ignoring the cooling trend that occurred before that and the overall flatlining of, of it in the long run. Okay, all right, so. That's just Colorado, and there we go. I'll just have that up and let you enjoy. The models don't work, and Alaska and Colorado are not warming. Okay, thank you. <laughs>